Let's take a minute to introduce three important families of continuous random variables. Uh, to start, let's go with the simplest one, which is uniform. X is uniform AB if it has the following PDF. So it is flat between A and B and zero otherwise. So that represents the fact that you are equally likely to take any value between A and B and nothing else. The CDF is just a constant slope between A and B, and it's one after that. Okay, so it just goes straight up and then stays at one. The mean is going to be right in the middle. It's gonna be A plus B over two, and the variance is this formula B minus A squared over 12, and we're used to seeing that 12 in the discrete uniform case. I just wanna take a minute to point out that the only real difference here between discrete uniform and uniform is that discrete uniform takes integer values between A and B, whereas here you can take any real values between A and B since it's continuous. The interpretation is really simple. It's just equally likely to be any value between A and B. And why would we need this? Well, let's say you have some measurement device and it has some um, noise or uncertainty and you know the range of that uncertainty, but you don't know anything else it's reasonable to just model that noise as uniform in that range. Next is the exponential random variable. So x is exponential lambda if it has the following PDF. So from zero onward, it looks like lambda e to the minus lambda x, and it's zero for negative values. Okay, so it's just falling exponentially. The CDF is just one minus e to the minus lambda x for non-negative values. So it's going up to one as x goes to infinity. The mean is one over lambda, the variance is one over lambda squared. And you can think of this as a continuous version of a geometric random variable. Okay, so that was kind of like waiting for the first thing to happen, but we were counting the number of attempts. Here it's like uh, just looking at the continuous time before an event happens. So applications of this include uh, hard drive lifetimes, uh, simple models of an infectious period for a disease, or the time until a component in a system fails, okay? So those are different models, and this has very similar properties to the geometric distribution that we saw earlier. The last one we'll introduce, and by far the most important, is a Gaussian. So X is Gaussian mu sigma squared, and sometimes we write that as uh, the script n mu sigma squared, if it has the following PDF, okay? So the PDF has this constant up front, and then it's e to the minus x minus mu squared over two sigma squared. It basically looks like this hill centered at mu, and you can think about sigma as the width of this hill. Of course, it has infinite width because it goes from negative infinity to positive infinity, but it's the width until it falls to a pretty low level. So the bulk of this, you can think of as having width sigma. Okay, so the CDF is a bit strange and it's defined by this function we're gonna call phi that I'm gonna write out on the next page. Okay, you can uh, draw it, that's fine, but we don't really uh, see this other than in this class. So this phi function we're gonna uh, talk about on the next page and it's something we're just gonna have to plug into, okay? So this is an integral that we can't evaluate in closed form. Um, so when we need a probability, we're gonna to have to plug into this function that we're gonna talk about next. The mean is really simple, it's just mu. Same with the variance, it's just sigma squared. So when you define the Gaussian, you um, write out the parameters and those parameters happen to be the mean and variance. The reason it's so important is that this is the uh, sum or average of many small random quantities or effects. So if you think about um, you know, something that you're observing that is made up of averaging a lot of different things that are more or less independent from each other, it's very reasonable to model it as Gaussian. And we'll see a bit later in the course that this happens um, also in kind of a formal way, but for now you can just take it as an intuition. Um, it has a lot of applications. I'll mention a few. So one is modeling noise, which you could think of as the contribution of lots of little effects 
um, that are perturbing your system. You could think about linear systems, inputs and outputs of linear systems, and also high dimensional data. Um, so there are many other applications. I think the most important thing to remember about Gaussians is that um, the reason we like to use them is not because the PDF has some particular form, but really it has some really uh, important and simplifying properties that I'm going to mention next. Okay, so what is this phi function? Well, the standard normal CDF phi of z is the CDF of a Gaussian 0, 1 random variable. Okay, so a 0, 1 Gaussian would have PDF, which is just 1 over root 2 pi e to the minus w squared over 2. Okay, so if you think about integrating this up to z, the area you would get, that would be the CDF of a Gaussian 0, 1 random variable. Okay, and we can't compute this integral in closed form, all right? So that's not something that our uh, basic calculus training will allow us to do. We can evaluate it numerically using a lookup table, MATLAB, scientific calculator, Wolfram Alpha, whatever you like. Um, you can see by symmetry at zero, it's gonna be one half because you've kind of captured half of this hill and it's symmetric. Um, but otherwise you're going to need to look, use a lookup table to get values. It's also symmetric in a different way. So uh, if you plug in minus C, that's one minus phi of C, okay? So this area and this area are the same. Okay, that makes sense. So if you wanna move the sign outside of the phi, then it's like taking the complement. Okay. Uh, for large values of z, sometimes we end up working with something that we call the standard uh, normal complementary CDF, q of z, and that's just 1 minus phi of z, or phi of minus z. And the reason we do that is that if you think about a value like uh, 0.9997, it might be easier to write that as 1 minus 3 times 10 to the minus something, okay? So as you get to uh, closer and closer to one, sometimes it's easier to just think about, well, what's that little bit? And how do I write that using um, a little bit different notation, like 10 to the minus something? Okay, and if you wanna calculate the probability that a Gaussian falls into an interval, you just take the difference in CDF values, and that's just the difference of these phi function values. So what you're doing is you're just plugging into this phi function twice, so you're getting the CDF at B, which is phi B minus mu over sigma, and the CDF at A, which is um, phi A minus mu over sigma. Okay, so that's how you calculate the probability of an interval for a Gaussian. And you need to use a lookup table for both of these phi functions. Let's do an example. So let's say that I tell you X is Gaussian 2, 9, so that's the mean and variance, and I wanna know the probability it's greater than five. The probability is greater than five, it's just one minus the probability that is less than or equal to five. The reason I did that is that this is the form of the CDF, it's the probability that something is less than or equal to a value. And for the Gaussian, we need to start with the CDF and then use the phi function. So we know for a Gaussian, the CDF is evaluated with the phi function, and I use this x minus the mean divided by sigma to plug into the phi function just for a Gaussian, okay? And um, once I've done that, I'm just gonna work things out. It's gonna be one minus phi, five minus two over root nine, and it's gonna be uh, one minus phi three over three, one minus phi one, and that's gonna be about one minus 0.8413. I got this from a lookup table for phi one, and you can just see that's 0.1587. Okay, what about a conditional probability? So what about the probability I'm less than eight given that I'm greater than five? Well, this is just shorthand for uh, two different events. So I have the event I'm less than eight, the event I'm greater than five. Call the first one event A, the second one event B. Okay, so this is just conditional probability. We can write the definition of conditional probability to remind ourselves it's A intersect B, take the probability, divide by the probability of B. So restrict and rescale. So um, 
you know, I just have to work out for myself what's going to be the intersection. Okay, in this case, between five and eight is the intersection. And then I'm just dividing by the probability I'm greater than five, which I've already worked out. Um, so the top I'm going to get using probability of an interval for a Gaussian, right? So if you go back to the previous slide, this is the formula we had for probability of an interval. I've just plugged in eight and five, and I'm keeping the denominator the same because I've already worked it out. Simplifying, I get six over three and three over three. Um, and so leave the denominator the same. So finally, I get phi of two minus phi of one. And I know the denominator is going to be one minus phi of one because I already worked that out above. Okay, and now I'm going to just plug into a lookup table and get these values. So 0 0.999772 minus 0 0.8413 over 0 0.1587. That's going to be 0 0.8563 if you work it out. So one of the nicest properties of Gaussians is that if I have a Gaussian random variable, and let's say I have x, which is Gaussian mu sigma squared, and I take a linear function, call it y, so y is ax plus b, that uh, random variable y is itself Gaussian. So it's going to be Gaussian a mu plus b, a squared sigma squared. So the update of the mean was by linearity of expectation, and the update of the variance was by variance of a linear function. But the important thing is that the family didn't change. If you have a Gaussian and you take a linear function, it will stay Gaussian, which is really nice. In general, if you want to determine the PDF of a function, okay, so let's say you have a function y equals g of x and x is a continuous random variable, this can be pretty involved. But for a linear function of a Gaussian, we don't need to follow all of that. We just need to figure out what is the new mean and the new variance based on the linear function. And we don't need to worry about things like Jacobians or complicated integrals. We just have to figure out the new mean and variance. So as an example, um, let's say I have x, which is Gaussian minus 1 and 3, and y, which is 2x minus 1. What kind of random variable is y? Well, I just told you that a linear function is going to be Gaussian if the original random variable is Gaussian, and that's the case. So I'm just updating the mean. So I write the mean of y as the mean of 2x minus 1. And by linearity of expectation, that's going to be 2 times the mean of x minus 1, which is 2 times minus 1 minus 1. So it's going to be minus 3. And the new variance of y is going to be the variance of 2x minus 1 using variance of a linear function, that's 2 squared times the variance of x, because the shift doesn't matter, and that's 4 times 3, which is 12. Okay, so y is Gaussian minus 3, 12. And the thing to keep in mind here is that, in general, if you take a linear function of uh, distribution, its family might change. So if you have an exponential, and you uh, say, let's say y is 2x minus 1, but x is exponential, then y will no longer be exponential. So you have to be a bit careful with this, but it works fine for Gaussians. And if you're interested in knowing how to get the PDF in general, there's a lot more information in your lecture notes.